What have we got up on the screen? I've got a screen there, the right to be forgotten. An early iteration of the uh, theme for Netui this year was uh, the next 25 years of the internet. Admirably ambitious, <clears throat> but a prospect I approach with the trepidation of a guy who's only ever really succeeded in predicting the recent past. As Arthur C. Clarke warned, any prediction that is believable is simply not bold enough. So instead, I'm going to pick a single topic and think out loud on that, the so-called right to be forgotten on the internet. It seems to me that there's a degree of dissonance uh, in the views held by this community about privacy. I am, of course, making a significant assumption here, but let me test it. I think you'll share the characteristics of many of my online communities, in, uh, in many of the online communities in which I participate. If I ask you whether the NSA, the GCSB, the SIS, or the Department of Internal Affairs uh, should monitor your emails, check in on your Skype calls, and track your browsing history, I think you'll respond with a chorus of no's. Why? Because privacy. I'll get a similar, if perhaps slightly less resounding response if I ask if it is okay for Google and Facebook to monitor your movements across the web and to manipul manipulate what you see as a result. Why? Privacy. It's a bit creepy to have someone aggregating your data and making assumptions about you on the basis of it. If I ask, should people be able to opt out of being indexed by search engines, we see a flip. Why? Because information wants to be free. Because it's in the public domain. Because freedom of expression. Because open and uncapturable internet. If I'm completely honest with you, my starting point on this topic so far has been somewhere close to that latter position. However, I take to heart the wise words of Tim Minchin, who in his inspiring graduation speech to the University of Western Australia, quoted Clint, East Clint Eastwood from the 1988 film Deadpool. Hard-boiled cop, Harry, dirty Harry Callahan says, opinions are like assholes, everyone's got one. Minchin pointed out, that the significant difference, however, is that you should constantly and thoroughly, and I'll add even in public, examine your opinions. <laughs> Over the next few minutes, I'm going to share some of the fruits of my self-examination and invite you to do the same. Now, as you might recall, uh, on May 13th this year, the European Court of Justice ruled that Google in Spain should break links to an old newspaper story about a debt of a plaintiff, Senor González because he'd paid that debt. The decision was based on the European uh, privacy law, and the principle behind it has been called the right to be forgotten. I should have tested this, shouldn't I? That, there we go. I'm actually not a big fan of the term a right to be forgotten. The decision was based on the Spanish legal requirement on the relevance of personal data. The right to be forgotten that has been under debate as part of the review of Europe's 1995 directive isn't yet part of EU law, though there are plans to make it so. So the EU, uh, the, the European Court of Justice has delivered something that looks like a right to be forgotten based on that 1995 law, which is very similar to our own. Also, <clears throat> a right to be forgotten means different things to different people. It can mean data portability so that if you decide to leave, say, Facebook or Trade Me, you should be able to take your links and content with you and have that deleted. Do we feel more comfortable with that formulation? It can mean a right to anonymity or to its cousin, obscurity. And it can mean removal from, of content from public search. In his typically prescient way, Australia's most famous jurist, Sir Michael Kirby, even proposed a right not to be indexed right back in 1999. And when he gave the example, Google wasn't on the scene. He quoted, uh, or he referred to those behemoths uh, of the search scene, Alta Vista. They have uh, achieved their right to be forgotten. <laughs> but let's take the phrase at face value for the moment. If we end up with this right, then who would it apply to? Well, everyone. If it's a right, then it doesn't make sense if it only applies to a few people. Can it mean the right to have people forget you? That's too passive. A right doesn't mean much if you can't enforce it. So unless you can convince them you're so boring you fade from their memory the moment you stop talking to them, what it actually means is the right to make people forget you. 
But again, we're not talking about people with their fallible memories, are we? It's the information systems, information machines that people have created that are doing the heavy lifting. So, we're really talking about a right to make machines forget you. Since the Spanish court case, Google in Europe have been receiving more than 10,000 requests a day that it forget about some kind of personal information, that it breaks links that are no longer relevant. Why would you want to make machines forget you? Privacy is all about helping people keep control over their own information in the face of technological innovations that lessen that control. And if every aspect of your life is being tracked by machines that never forget, then more and more of your information is heading out of your control at every moment. Back in the 1970s, US courts recognised the concept of practical obscurity, where information that might have been available had drifted out of availability, but information storage prices and volumes are constantly dropping. Assuming that within 25 years you'll be able to store the current internet on something the size of a pen, what is the structural incentive for people operating these machines to throw anything away? If we're never going to run out of space, then practical obscurity does not work as a concept. As security expert Bruce Schneier said, we are embarking on a great experiment of never forgetting. Eventually, nearly every aspect of our lives will be logged and searchable. Will we lose some of our ability to change as we grow because we'll be locked closer and closer to who we have been in the past? Some might say we're already there with Facebook. The conversation which has begun in Europe and which is gathering momentum around the world is a response to this increasingly ubiquitous hoarding and storing of personal information. But it's complicated because if you can make a machine forget about you, you can make, a lot, you can make it a lot harder for people to talk about you, which can be very attractive for people with things to hide which need the kinds of things that uh, need more than pants. The information you'd like to remove about yourself is sometimes the exact information that other people want to keep hold of and to be able to access. Is this, is this kind of talk an affront to free speech? Surely free speech isn't something we should give up without taking a very careful look at what the future might hold. Harvard Law Professor Lawrence Lessig attempted to give us a tool to look into the future in his early 1990s book, Code and Other Laws of Cyberspace. Professor Lessig suggested that there were four ways that people were regulated, four forces acting on the individual. These are the market, mores, law, and architecture. The example he used to explain these four terms was the bicycle. Imagine a meeting of serious people who want to accomplish the important goal of protecting bicycles. After an hour or two, they settle on these four options, market, mores, law and architecture. First, they could subsidise bikes and make them cheap. That would, not, that would make it not worth the thieves' while to steal them. This is targeting, targeting the market, how buying and selling things reflects human behaviours. Second. They could try and change public opinion and make bike theft unacceptable by mounting a big advertising campaign with a catchy slogan. Maybe go to Facebook and post, steal bikes, lose likes. This is hitting the mores, the way people think as a group, social acceptance. They could introduce a statutory mandatory life sentence for bike theft. This is the law part of the story, a formal and codified set of rules for society mediated through designated bodies like courts and parliament and involving coercive powers. Fourthly, they can attach padlocks to every wall, making it as easy as possible to lock your bike up. This is using architecture, the structure of the world, to accomplish your goal. Your goal sorry. But also remember that each of these affects the other. The law has to deal with the world as it is, the existing market forces, the way people think. The market is similar, similarly constrained by mores, and architecture, and laws, and so on and so on, and so on. <laughs> the big thing that Lessig realised is that in an electronic world, architecture is fluid. It's made of code. So it can be rewritten silently and seamlessly. When you want to protect something with architecture in the real world, you do it with bricks and mortars. It's obvious and it's clunky. When Google, say, wants to change the way it stores its email or how it ties together its users, it changes its code. Code is mutable. They can change the landscape of how data is stored and used and, and, and how and when they want to. 
and how, when they want to. So let's break it down and apply these four views to the right to be forgotten. But don't forget when we use that term, we're incorporating the right to have information deleted and the right to force a search engine not to link to other sites hosting information. I could look at each of these four and discuss how each of the other three would affect an attempt to address an emerging issue solely by one of them, but I haven't got time. So I'm just gonna focus on some of the interactions and characteristics. Let's start with the market. The economics of the web are odd, aren't they? A company makes Yo, an app that basically does this. And it's worth millions of dollars. Other companies make billions of dollars from providing elaborate and expensive services for free. And then selling advertising that people have convincingly argued might not even work. There's a crazy free-for-all competition in the app space and something close to a monopoly in the search space. This is all a weird marketplace. But in some ways, the market is king of the web right now because it has the clearest goal. The mores are still fluid because the internet is comparatively new. We're still deciding how we deal with always-on connectedness as a society. The architecture is also fluid because technology is changing the way we talk to each other from one day to the next. And the law is fluid because it's always playing catch-up which actually isn't such a bad thing uh, because hasty lawmaking always creates problems. By comparison with the other three, the market has a very clear goal. It wants to make money. You know what they say. There it is, that's what they say. They say it so often that I don't need to say it. Because the clear market incentive of all these information tools and services is to find a way to extract money out of information, out of your information, for as long and as hard as the other three forces will let the market get away with it. So how does a right to be forgotten square with that market incentive? How is the market likely to support or hinder the right to be forgotten on the internet? Let's look at the um, market mores tension. Out of the four forces, the market is the most deliberately responsive to tension from the other three. It's all about trying to find the best and most profitable solution to solve the equation of architecture, law, and mores in a way that maximizes profit. So the market is well placed to provide its own solutions to the tensions of the other three forces. The strongest tension is probably from the mores. Companies operating in the market need to respond to mores because if they don't, they go out of business. <clears throat> Competition demands responsiveness. The recent alarm over Facebook's mood alteration research is a good indicator of how quickly public opinion can react to a perceived misuse of user information. And the never-ending fountain of revelations from WikiLeaks and Edward Snowden about how information has been collected and used in, in ways which users may not have anticipated. There's a possibility this will just lead to apathy rather than more concern, which is something I'll look at in a moment. But in the short to medium term, the change in an input is just the sort of thing that the market is well placed to respond to. We're already seeing services like Snapchat make a virtue of how much information they don't collect, how it is not available for search, how it self-destructs after a limited time and therefore does not need to be forgotten. If people can price their privacy in a way that makes sense, the market will respond. But also, don't underestimate the capacity of those with the greatest to lose in, an, in the unregulated marketplace to attempt to influence the mores to better support their business model. Privacy is over, declared Zuckerberg in January 2010. And do you think Google might be doing a wee bit of astroturfing in its response to the European Court decision? They had 10,000 takedown requests on the first day of offering their form. Odd how quickly it became known in the media that a pedophile and a former bankrupt were amongst them. In the last week, they've notified influential journalists and bloggers that they've broken links to former stories. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm just saying. <laughs> Let's move on to market and the law. Market entities need to be legally compliant, otherwise they get in trouble. There's a long history of the law stepping in when one player becomes monopolistic, and in those cases, the law, as described by the clash, prevails. However, there are lots of loopholes to discover along the way, as we've seen in the copyright area, where the market has been fighting the law for a couple of decades. As the regulator in New Zealand in relation to personal information, I have some options to address market issues, but hasty law is often bad law. So let's have a look at the architecture. Architecture in this context is the least restrictive of the three forces because as Professor Lessig pointed out, code is architecture. 
So market entities that are working with code to get to create their own architecture. And even when market entities try to lock down their code, it doesn't last long. Jailbreak apps are an architectural innovation responding to a lack of individual control. Existing systems, as it's often said, generally treat disruptive change as a threat that needs to be fought against. Even when they started as a scrappy disruptive underdog, once the scrappy underdog becomes the leader of the pack, it loses its sympathy for the next scrappy underdogs. So it seems possible that if the idea of a right to be forgotten takes root, then we may see a vigorous corporate defence of their right to have machines never ever forget about you by use of their architectural control of code, as we've seen in the area of digital rights management. I'm not convinced by, yet by the idea of a concrete right to be forgotten, but the inherent dynamism in always needing to justify your value proposition means that if we don't end up with the, that right exactly, there is scope for the market to address the desires and fears that it represents. Maybe not if you build it, they will come. More if you don't build it, they won't come, so get building. Let's have a look, quick look at the mores part of this equation. It's been a busy couple of years in privacy. WikiLeaks, the Edward Snowden revelations about the NSA, and a range of well-publicised data breaches at home and abroad have made privacy a household word. People are becoming more aware and concerned. But there's also the chance that everyone will assume everything is known about them and give up the privacy is dead or get over it approach. Leave your pants at home. There's no lack of concern at the growing power of big companies. Facebook, Google, Amazon, the rest. You could argue that we're seeing the rise of multinational information aristocracies. But importantly, there is no intermediary, intermediary between us and them. We all use these services and we give our information to them of our own free will. We're voting with our index fingers, one click at a time. And to quote Vaughan Davis, you tick the effing box, people. That's a book that consists only of a title that Vaughan tweets often in response to the frustrations uh, vented on Twitter. But all of these clicking fingers can add up to a real difference. There's always the potential for a great wave of consumer action. You saw it with the web blackout directed against SOPA and PIPA, the US Anti-Piracy Act, our own activism against the three strikes Skynet law. You might see it around net neutrality. There's even a chance that the right to be forgotten might capture the public imagination. A key issue is that most people don't value their personal information very highly. On the one hand, it makes sense because each individual data point is not much use to anyone, but if you flip it around, the multinational information aristocracies are nothing without the information of their users. And another possibility is that we'll all stop caring as much about whether someone might have smoked a spliff, recorded an embarrassing video, or said some risque things in a chat room. Do people still use chat rooms? I don't know. I don't. The social expectations about acceptable behaviour can change fast. Look at smoking and drunk driving, both of which were much more mainstream behaviours a couple of decades ago. As Giles Fraser, a South London priest and Guardian columnist, put it in a thoughtful opinion piece after the ECJ decision came out, I predict the internet generation is going to end up being a lot better at what we used to be comfortable calling forgiveness. For if we are going to find it more and more difficult to forget, then we are surely going to find it more and more important to forgive. This change is happening right now, and it will continue to happen. But if we end up in a more open, mature and forgiving world where no one cares about their permanent record because everything is awesome, as they say in the Legoland, is it enough for us to rely on right now? Maybe. I got out of sync with my slides, I'm sorry. I'm not used to this uh, flash prezi business. Completely lost track. Anyway, let's look at some of the ways the social expectations, the mores, might change in response to the challenge of a possible right to be forgotten. Apathy, or perhaps acceptance, is a better way of putting it. Uh, response, panic or concern is another. The law might say you always, you always had this right. It's nothing new. Agencies need to make sure the information they're using to make decisions about you is accurate, up-to-date, relevant and not misleading. Uh, that's uh, in our law and that's exactly the grounds on which the European Court made its decision about Senor Gonzalez. The market via advertising is pretty great at telling you things are all okay as they are and suggesting that things could be better if you just bought this one new gadget. But it also might lead you to rely on those new gadgets. 
We've got Snapchat. If there are any problems that actually, uh, if there are any problems that actually, then just wait for an appropriate gadget to fix it. One of the points of the, about law is that it isn't static. It changes in response to events, to accomplish goals, and to remedy market failures. Here we are. I'm caught up with myself. Back to the law. The right to be forgotten as seen in the decision about the Spanish gentleman uh, comes from the existing law about relevance. A broader right to be forgotten is before the European Parliament. It recognises the desire of an individual to determine the development of his life in an autonomous way without being perpetually or periodically stigmatised as a consequence of a specific action performed in the past. Might seem progressive, um, although the European Union still hasn't managed to uh, make their declarations in gender neutral language. In New Zealand, we have um, Information Privacy Principle 7, which allows people to correct their personal information. You can do it right now. Call up someone who's holding information about you that's wrong, or out of date, or inaccurate, or irrelevant, and tell them to correct it. And that can include deletion. If they refuse, uh, they, if they refuse to make the correction, that is, or they don't want to delete it, they have to attach a statement setting out uh, why you disagree with that information. Another thing that I can do if we don't end up with a, a right to be forgotten is to target the end user. There is a principle, as I mentioned before, that says an agency using information has to ensure that it's up to date, complete, relevant, and not misleading. So maybe we're not going to break Google's links to that old um, uh, video of you uh, karaokeing at your cousin's wedding 15 years ago, uh, but if a prospective employer makes decisions about your career based on it, you can come to me and I can challenge the employer about that. So employers, insurers, medical, professional, disciplinary bodies, professional associations, all of these agencies are obliged to close their mind to that out-of-date information already. Could a New Zealand citizen assert a right to have links removed from a Google search on their name? The New Zealand law does differ in some key respects from the Europeans, but we have a similar obligation to keep information relevant, as I said. What is the onus if a New Zealand person asserts a right of correction under Principle 7? Does the purpose element of the non-retention principle, that's Principle 9, absolve search engines of the obligation to proactively purge old content? What do I mean by that? There's a principle which says if you hold personal information, you shouldn't keep it uh, longer than is required for a lawful purpose. Now, there's a kind of self-defining uh, logic in there, um, but maybe we can uh, uh, challenge some of the retention period decisions that agencies are making there. Should I issue a code of practice which spells out the respective rights of search engines and individuals? As Privacy Commissioner, I can make law. I can issue a, a code of practice which sets out what search engines and other uh, agencies could do. I'm not anywhere near a space of uh, suggesting that's something that I want to get into at the moment, but uh, it's there as an option. I mean, these are all questions which I'm obliged to leave hanging because of my role as a regulator and decider of complaints under the Act. So I'm happy to chuck the questions out there, um, but uh, I'm looking for the answers from you. I can't be giving them out just at this stage. The Law Commission recently finished its four-year review of the Privacy Act. Actually, not so recently. It was in 2008. They didn't suggest a right to be forgotten, but they did propose a right to anonymity or pseudonymity in the report. That right to pseudonymity is an interesting one. In, um, in Australia, there's a legal right to access health services pseudonymously, where that can be accommodated. Following on from the Law Commission review is going to be a new Privacy Act over the next year or two. Ending up with the right to be forgotten along the lines of an EU directive is one possibility, though admittedly a distant one. If there's a good argument for it, um, if it becomes important enough to people for more eyes, we might see that. Architecture is not just the web, it includes human architecture. How are we doing for time there, Michelle? Good. Good? I'd... Thanks. Um, we are human beings with fallible memories and limited storage space, so we need memory because the world at any instant does not provide us with enough information to make the best decision about what to do next. And as humans, we've supplemented our fallible memory with even ever better prostheses, like books, libraries and computers. In the process, we've sanctified that notion of memory. The destruction of the library 
of Alexandria is a historical crime that still has the power to make antiquarians shudder because of losing, losing all that knowledge seems criminal. However, while memory is anything in the past, if you make it fast enough, the past becomes the present. A record of where you were five minutes ago is a record of where you are right now. If you let people control what was said about them, then you are also giving them control over what will be said about them. There's a famous story about Barbara Streisand and her cliff top estate. She sued to remove a photograph and in the process made it vastly more famous. So there's a self-correcting aspect to the element of, to the process of online censorship. The web treats censorship as damage and roots around it, as they say. There's an architectural protection supported by the mores of free speech. You'll be relieved to see I'm coming to conclusions. <laughs> Technical predictions are a quick route to embarrassment, but it is safe to say that computers will keep getting better, and they will keep getting better at a faster and faster rate. Over time, retention will become more frictionless, and storage capacity and Moore's law follow the logarithmic curve relentlessly upward. We're going to find some way to reintroduce we are either going to find some way to reintroduce friction and loss into the system, or get used to living in a golden cage of information tweeting happily at our own reflection. So some questions for you. What do you think a world where we have a right to more explicitly control our information, where, how our information is stored and referenced, to make machines forget us, would look like? Is there a real demand for it? And is that demand strong enough to pull the architecture and the market with it. And if we're going to tweak the market, the mores, the law, or the architecture to bring about that right, which version do we want to follow? A right to anonymity? A right not to be indexed? A right to obscurity? Or should we merely forgive rather than forget? <laughs>